speaker of this session is Ismail Özgür Suganti. Um, he has graduated from the Department of Art Education at Gazi University Ankara and completed a master's and doctorate degree in art education at Arizona State University. His recent research concentrates on links between teaching and various modes of visuality, along with the historical and cultural constructs that shape them. His artistic work focuses on modes of pictorial rep representation in traditional formats, such as drawing, oil painting, and book art. Currently, Suganchi is associate professor at Andalu University. I will try to make this very short because it has been a long time. Uh, so this is uh, about a museum and our experience after visiting uh, this museum with my students. So I will first start with a video.
Today I'm here to introduce this strange museum to you. I call it strange because this museum documents fiction. The Museum of Innocence first appeared as a novel. It was published in 2008, four years before the museum was opened in Istanbul. Both the museum and the novel concentrate on the habit of collecting. In the novel, Kemal, the main character, collects everything related to Füsun, his unreachable love. Here you see the American cover of the novel. Next to it, Pamuk is posing in front of Kemal's house. Well, Kemal is a fiction character. He actually never lived, but the novelist, Orhan Pamuk, believes that this is Kemal's house. Pamuk made a museum for him in his house. This building is an ordinary Istanbul house for middle class people. Uh, and of course, we are talking about the 1960s. No significance in terms of architecture. No historically significant people, person ever lived in this house. This is in all measures a very ordinary house in, Ist in Istanbul. Here is the interior, second floor, from the museum. You see cabinets labeled with numbers. These numbers represent chapters from the novel. Uh, let's have a deeper look. Chapter 32, the shadows and ghosts I mistook for Fisun. Here we see an arrangement, a map, an installation, a chart, or a visual representation of locations in Istanbul that Kemal thinks he saw Fisun. All of them numbered and visually represented. Chapter 68, this is also the cabinet 68, 4,213 cigarette stops. You see here a collection of dots sorted down in columns. And if you look at carefully, you can see the dates at the top, 1976, 1977. If we get closer and more closer, we will see that these are the cigarettes smoked by Fusun in conversation with Kemal. And Kemal, with his abnormal tendency to collect, collected all of, most of, let's say, the cigarette butts. And he also, when he went back home, noted down what they were conversing about in little sentences. But of course, Kemal actually never lived. This is a fictitious character. So the novelist writes down the text. Chapter 73, also the cabinet number 73, Fisun's driving license. Well, in the novel, they go to buy, they go to apply for a driver's license with Fisun. And that day, Fisun wears this kind of clothes. But of course, like Kemal, Fisun never lived. He, she is a fictitious character. She never existed. But here in this museum, we have the dress of Fisun and a lot of things about the relationship between women and cars in the visual culture of Istanbul in the 80s. The old photographs. Now, for art education, what I can say, departing from this museum, 
will be the Nobel Museum duo and the studio. Actually, if uh, you, uh, if you uh, can have it, I gave the uh, catalog of the museum, which is called the Innocence of Objects. After visiting this museum in an action study I conducted with my students, three main themes unfolded regarding studio instruction. For students, instruction was mostly irrelevant because teachers followed a do as I say mode of instruction. The linear curriculum teachers followed was insensitive to individual aspirations of students. Students thought they were not cared for because teachers interact with them only in studio hours. This interaction was very limited, always formal, and often insincere. Focusing on these problem areas, I changed my way of teaching. This required self-reflection and more patience on my part. Once the do as I say principle was forsaken, the general character of the studio was altered from one in which all students are working in the same type of project to one, several projects are undertaken. I think this is very important. To achieve such atmosphere as Nuddings would argue, I didn't need to establish a deep, lasting, time-consuming personal relationship with every student. This was humanly impossible. What I did was guidance on demand. What I tried to do was, in a collegial environment, to be totally and non-selectively present to the student, to each one of them, as they addressed me. So we rearranged the studio. Now, do, did I have a say in this? Of course. But I have the amount of say as much as the other students have. So it's a totally democratic environment, even when organizing the studio. We spent more time outside campus. For this, we organized trips to various cities, museums, concerts, and got together in there in students' favorite places. These included bars and streets and these kind of places. I made use of Facebook, Spotify, SoundCloud, Pinterest to open more channels of interaction. Uh, since we have limited time, I will just now show you uh, three projects, and then my presentation will finish. Now, the first one is called Faces. This is by an Erasmus student from Germany, taking my studio art course. The project was simply on communicating subjective experience through visuality. The student interviewed people and asked them about being a foreigner in the city. Now, coming from Germany, she was very much impressed with the faces of people in Turkey. So she had the freedom to focus on that in my studio. Normally, if I have given her an assignment, that wouldn't be possible. Okay, so she basically went out and interviewed people from different walks of life in, on the streets of Istanbul and on the streets of Eskişehir, and these were the main three questions. And the bigger picture looks something like this. A second project is book cover design. This is more traditional type of uh, project, but in the context of Turkey, even this project is somehow innovative. So, all of my students, almost all of them, are keeping journals, and they are very interested in having beautiful covers for them. So we started from that departure point, and then students created a lot of uh, designs, and we were invited to a workshop with my students. You see 10 of them right now. Uh, it's book cover design workshop in a symposium in Turkey and also they sold a lot of them and it was also a very interesting experience for them. And then these are the left outs, let's say, so we made a collage. They made a collage and it's 
in the studio, reminding them these days, these workshop days, and that gives some ownership on their part uh, with relation to the studio, which is important. The last uh, project is called the Wish Wall. Well, it's coming from the Turkish tradition. Actually, it's coming from tradition in many Middle Eastern countries. Uh, if you have a wish, you're, you just go and attach a fabric to a tree. Now, again, started by one of my uh, students. Okay, this is the last sentence of uh, the name of the rose by Umberto Eco. And nomina nuda tenemus would be about names. I am not capable of translating it to the English language, but it's, it's something like, I will give it a try, only, we have only the bare names, something like that. So the project was totally about names. And so the fabric, you know, Tur Turkey is famous in textiles, so the easiest thing you can find around in Turkey is fabrics. So students brought a lot of fabrics. Now, we are not making a wish tree, we are making a wish ball, a wish wall. So, one of them wrote Francis Picabia, one of them wrote Muhlis Akarsu, a Turkish singer, the other one wrote some other name, I don't know because there were a lot of names. But it was like a festival in the studio, they invited other people, and it became like a carnival in which everybody was stapling fabrics. This is five meters width, five meters. So here we have students, non-students, everybody coming and joining in the, uh, let's say, it became like a performance. We have a video of this. Uh, but of course, I'm not going to show it. Uh, that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.